All right, thank you everyone for joining today on Anteater Insider Live. This is the inaugural, we inaugural edition of our new webcast uh, to basically share information about the, the re-engagement of campus operations. Um, it's a live show produced here by the uh, Office of Strategic Communications and Public Affairs for staff and faculty um, for us to really get, get out that information so that everyone um, knows what's going on. Today, we are focused on the COVID-19 Symptom Check app. So you've probably gotten the emails about this telling you to take the training and uh, hopefully you've done that or you're gonna do it soon. Um, but basically, we're gonna hear from Stephen Whalen, who is the Executive Director of People Services here at UCI, uh, about the app and uh, how it was developed and, and who needs to use it. And then we'll also hear afterwards from Dr. Marian Fedorik, who is a specialist in occupational medicine at UCI Health and is involved in the health response uh, post-symptom check. So during the presentations, we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the, at the bottom of your Zoom window to pose some questions um, and then also uh, upvote some questions that, that you want to hear. So thank you again for joining. And Stephen, thank you for coming here and talking to us on Anteater Insider Live. Take it away. Thank you, and I definitely appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I hope my slide's coming through perfectly. Can you flip the display? Perfect, okay. Thank you, so uh, like you said, uh, really pleased to have the opportunity. Uh, my name is Stephen Whelan, Executive Director of People Services. And what we are is we're a centralized HR team and we support and have the privilege of supporting health sciences, the medical center, uh, and, and campus. Uh, we're located in both Irvine and Orange, uh, and about the uh, March timeframe, we started to hear what the amazing things that were happening at the medical center. They were doing this responsive site, uh, and they were actually physically able to check everyone's temperature, uh, whether entering buildings or on the premises. Uh, it's an amazing feat, an ama amazing accomplishment, uh, and that inspired us. But of course, UCI campus is, uh, is different. We can't control all the access points. We have people, students uh, living on site. We have other uh, employees with many, many, many different access points and going from building to building. So we really were posed with a challenge. How can we leverage our, potentially our existing partners and find a way uh, to leverage technology and do something that's more like a self-accountability uh, check uh, because that's who we are at UC Irvine. We're, we're self-accountable. Uh, and we ended up using ServiceNow. And if you're not familiar with ServiceNow, uh, there's something, uh, there's a vendor we launched on January 2nd with the Employee Experience Center, uh, and that technology has integrated the entire enterprise across all three business units, including the Medical Center, Campus Health Sciences. Or you may be more familiar with them when you look, uh, when you create a no IT help ticket, it helps us track these, uh, you know, these cases and ensure they're resolved timely. But with that said, given that one of the two uh, most prominent uh, uh, you know, case management vendors in the world, we asked them if they had any solutions. And they came out with something they were working with a DC firm on called the emergency outreach. Uh, the goal initially there was to notify employees in real time if we had something particular to say. But we asked them, well, what happens if we wanted to say something every day? We wanted to send a notification to our employees, ask them a question, and based on their response, we can give them pertinent information just to their needs. It really was a round peg in a square hole, and why uh, a square. Uh, and ultimately, you know, they were great partners, but I will say our campus OIT staff really made it work. And I couldn't be proud, prouder of them and more thankful that what we'll be looking at today was definitely a lot of hard work uh, and engineering uh, on their part. So like we talked about, our goal really, we wanted this self-accountability. This is important. And you may have seen the executive uh, mandate come through recently, effective next week. This will be mandatory for staff, faculty, and we're even leveraging this technology for students. But that currently isn't the focus of this conversation. We want to ask our employees, even if they're working remote, to answer a question Monday through Friday. And we'll talk about different uh, schedules uh, in the next slide down. Uh, but there's certainly options for us, but the key is for employees, wherever they are, 
uh, and unless they're working dedicated to the medical center, to answer a, few, uh, answer a question so we know that people are engaged and participating. We also know it's very important uh, that we give our leaders the dashboards and reports so we can ensure not necessarily what people are responding to, but the fact that they're actively engaged in responding because it is, again, this self-accountability is so important and we all know that. And then, of course, the campus-wide communication. This Working Well program is well uh, beyond just the Working Well daily symptom checking app. Um, but of course, we wanted to be part of that communication plan, reminding people that if you're sick, don't come into the office. Uh, and admittedly, uh, some people struggle with that, like myself, until this pandemic. Uh, you know, social distancing, physical distancing, you know, wearing masks and things like that. So we're part of this broader communication campaign because. Uh, again, this app is just one component to getting people, uh, you know, reminding people how to be safe uh, and giving them the tools to do so. So it's pretty simple. How do you do this? So right now, uh, again, it's going to be uh, mandatory next week. So we're going to enroll everyone that's based in Irvine. But currently, only if you've been submitted to, uh, to be enrolled, would you get the email. We'll look at those emails in just a second. Once you're enrolled, uh, it, it, you'll get an email. You'll, we'll be asking you a question. Uh, or if you're enrolled, you can also download the app. Uh, and that app uh, is the choice of many. Uh, it's the same thing. The email and the app are identical. You respond once to either and we register the response and you'll, get, you'll still get the email response and the response from the app. So they're one and the same. It is really employee faculty uh, preference. If by chance you don't have access to technology like your Google phone or a computer or choose not to use it, you can call us. You can call the Employee Experience Center or the Corona virus response team at 949-824-9918 or email us at eec at uci.edu. Currently our hours are eight to five, but we're looking at expanding those to meet the, uh, the needs of next week and more to come on that. So this is a sample of the, uh, of the email. So what will happen is each morning between two and 5 a.m. you'll get an email like this. Uh, and we'll be asking you, are you scheduled to come to work today? If not, you can click that button and you'll get that email in the middle. It says, great, be safe, work well, uh, you know, have a good day. If you are scheduled to come in that day, we're gonna ask if you have any of the CDC recommended symptoms to review. Uh, and of course, if this isn't a chronic condition, you may not be having these symptoms. You may hit no and you'll see the email that you get up to the top right-hand corner. So basically, you're, you're welcome to come back to work. If you are experiencing these symptoms and they're not chronic, that's when you would respond yes. And this is what is so critical to the process. And that's what uh, Dr. Federick will be discussing later, His and him and his amazing team. Uh, we want to connect you with them. So first and foremost, we wanna say, do not come to work. We wanna say, remind, uh, tell your supervisor you're not coming to work as well. And we wanna give the Center of Operational uh, uh, Organizational and Environmental Health uh, their phone number. We wanna let you know where you can call or where you can email. If you have questions, so Dr. Federuk and his amazing team can help you walk through your complicated, possibly complicated set of uh, symptoms or scenarios uh, and give you the best possible advice. Something to note, we did have a few uh, you know, challenges when we pulled this out. So working on site is a relative term. Uh, we did have two instances where people actually weren't coming to Irvine, but they were working on behalf of UC Irvine and they did have symptoms. And in that case, you're still hitting yes because we want you to stay at home, you know, protect yourself, quarantine, tell your supervisor, and contact COEH or email them. Uh, and so please, you know, if you're having those symptoms, yes is the right response. We also had the app that we talked about. And again, the email and the app, we're asking the same questions. We had some text and size constraints. You can see some slight differences here. But again, one response by either, either channel is all we need. Uh, to get to you either the information you need to say, you're welcome back to work. Don't worry, you're not coming into the office. Or of course, you're going to contact Dr. Fed, Dr. Federer and his team. We are um, translating this in many different languages. We have one for students because students' processes is a little different than our, our staff and faculty. Uh, we are rolling out Spanish in the next couple of weeks or, or soon thereafter. Uh, and we also have alternate schedules. But right now, everyone's default is a Monday through Friday. By chance, if you're coming in over the weekend, please email the COVID response team at COVID19 at uci.edu. And the following week, we can schedule, for a, schedule you for a seven-day notification period 
uh, where you'll be getting these uh, notifications and emails Monday through Sunday. Lastly, our group reporting. Uh, you know, this was key for us, and I mentioned at the beginning, we really wanted to give leaders insight into how their divisions and departments are participating. Only a few, very select few administrators know if the answer is yes, no, not on site. That's not the objective of these reports and dashboards. You can see here, it's uh, acknowledged, not acknowledged. So we want to ensure employees are being engaged with this technology. We created a today's dashboard. I know it's a bit small to see, a week's dashboard, and a historical dashboard. So we can really monitor trends of our employees' participation, not health status responses. With that said, this data is only collected for 30 days. Every day, we erase the 31st day, uh, and it's not shared with anybody uh, or any group or organization. Also important to note, if you did respond yes, and you do contact uh, the COEH, that data and that, that connection is on the, you know, Dr. Federuk's team. Now, you know, they are the clinicians, they have, they store that data in different manners, no, no employees, uh, PHI or health status is ever going to be tracked in this system. That's not the purpose. The purpose and the goal of this is to get you connected to the clinicians, not document or store that conversation you're having with those clinicians. So this is really uh, what you're seeing here is the only thing we're really storing inside the application. So we're really pleased we were one of the first to do this, we think in the country, because we really did, with our OITs, help modify an existing module that was being used in a different way. Uh, we've since presented this to others like Merced and Berkeley and six others across the country. They've asked us for help. They're adopting it. I know OIT actually installed this inside UC Merced. Uh, and it looks very similar. We've made some modifications, but uh, they're using the exact same process or others uh, beginning across the country. Uh, and, you know, again, it, as I mentioned earlier, being UCI and being, you know, ourselves well and the, and the concern with the wellness of our employees, you know, this self-accountability is a huge piece, but not the only piece, to ensuring we're doing the right things for our organization. And we're really pleased to have been able to do it uh, so soon and get it ready for the executive mandate coming out next week. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I'm open to questions. I don't see the question board. Uh, Aaron, if you could help guide me if there are any. Yes, thank you for presenting uh, all that information, Stephen. We really appreciate it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please drop that in the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screen there. Um, but I'll kick it off with one simple clarification question. Um, first of all, so everyone needs to use this app and it, you need to use it whether you're going to campus that day or not. Is that, is that right? Great question. I need to clarify. Yes, absolutely. So to effectively, effectively engage participation, even if you're not scheduled to come in, even through uh, January 4th, we still want everyone every day to say, I'm not coming on site or just acknowledge what their status is. That way we can truly engage the participation rates. Uh, it's very, very important to do so. Okay, great. And then, you know, what if, uh, you know, what if I'm on the app or I'm on the email and uh, I have what feels just like a really minor cough or something like that? Uh, and I'm not sure if I should click yes that I have this particular symptom, you know, what should I do in that case? I think you should wait uh, to Dr. Federer gets on the line uh, <laughs> and he can tell you that because I don't want to overstep my bounds being HR. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do believe you'd be clicking yes and then contacting the uh, clinicians, but uh, I would love to hear uh, his team's response on that. Great. And that was so interesting to hear you talk about how other campuses, you know, Merced and, and some other places are already using the app. Um, you know, what was the response uh, among some of your peers when, you know, you started sharing this technology and, and this process with them? I, you know, that, that's a great question. You know, I think they were really impressed. A lot of time, a lot of groups were actually going to use survey technology, which can work on a small scale. But when you start sending, you know, 17 of these, 17,000 of these a day, they quickly realized that those kind of survey tools wouldn't give you the reporting, the analytics, the participation that you can really manage. So ultimately, our scalability to this model, uh, the fact that we could actually, like in the case of Merced, we could build it and, and, and OIT literally just reconfigured and dropped it in in a matter of days. Uh, I think they were really impressed uh, that we kind of forged the way and now it's just a matter of replicate, modify, and of course, brand it uh, to their specific university. So lots of great feedback. 
Um, but again, that scalability was key because we were quickly realizing as we were running to do this, uh, you know, unfortunately, this isn't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, the, you know, the pandemic and, and, you know, returning to work where these things aren't necessary. So it was great feedback, great response. And again, hats off to our, our partners at ServiceNow and OIT. Well, it's great to have some uh, anteater pride in, in us being, you know, ahead of the curve on this one. So we have a, a question here in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, you know, will a communication go out to all employees about this requirement uh, that rolls out next week in case they're not here listening today? Yeah, absolutely. I don't have the details on one. We're still working uh, on that. We, we saw the, the, you know, the order come out yesterday. So I imagine the, um, the communication will include, obviously, the, the mandatory nature of the process, who needs to participate, uh, and then also uh, a link to how to you know, respond via email, and also if you, if you prefer the app. But, you know, obviously, many people don't have company phones. It's personal preference. But if that is your preference, uh, we'll have instructions on how to download the app. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll have instructions on how to support the app. So if you have questions, we already have a dedicated support team, the, the coronavirus support, te support team, uh, you know, 49918, that can help any employee that's struggling with using the app or not getting the email. So th that will all come out, I'm sure, with the Zotmail referencing the, the order. Great, thank you for that. And then we have one more question here that just came through on the, the Q&A. Um, so how do you suspend the app if you're on leave or on sabbatical? Great question. I think we'll need to finalize that. I, what we can do is you can email the, the, the coronavirus response team if you're on sabbatical for an extended period of time. Uh, and leaves will naturally be, uh, we're, we're leveraging the OIT technology, so leaves will naturally be excluded when it hits that system. It may take a few days because now we're in the UC path world where data does take uh, maybe a day or two to get back to UCI but you'll automatically be excluded from the, uh, you know, the working well symptom checker once that, that data hits our, our, our system. All right. Great question. Well, thank, you, thank you so much for, for answering these questions, Stephen. Let's, uh, let's move on to Dr. Marian Fedorik, who we've referenced a few times now um, and is leading the way on you know, what happens after employees use the symptom check-in app. So Dr. Fedorik, thank you for uh, joining us today on Anteater Insider Live. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, just double checking if you can hear me. We can hear you great. Great. Uh, so can you see the slides or no? I'm not sure you can see the slides. Not yet. Can you see the slides at all or no? Uh, try sharing your screen. All right, there we go. Okay, you can hit, see them now? Good. Welcome everybody. Um, so this, I'll just say a few quick words about COEH, Center for Occupational Environmental Health. We're uh, a uh, occupational health unit that's on the campus that's been here for several decades. Uh, we provide a variety of occupational environmental services. We have a residency program. We have residents here, we have uh, several key core faculty, and, and we're now involved in this whole response or the whole campus response to the COVID related uh, events. And so what I wanted to do now is kind of overview the kinds of the, in, in reference to the working well, the daily symptom check, what really happens. If you get the number, it says call COEH, what happens? Well, first of all, we receive a call from our front office staff, which are medical assistants, and they would obtain demographic information, who you are, contact information, et cetera. And also request information about where you're calling from, because this has been used for a while. And as I'll say later, there have been some people that have come to work, do the app while they arrive at work and have positive symptoms. So they're getting a positive response but in lieu of staying at home, they're actually at, at the workplace. So we, we certainly will focus on where they're calling from. And then that information will be provided to a physician and all people who call with a reported symptom do get the chance to sp speak to myself or a number of my colleagues or potentially also some of our resident physicians who are uh, in their training program to obtain certain kinds of uh, information and make a determination about the significance of those particular symptoms. So there's generally two physicians on call and the employee will speak to the physician as part of the initial call, usually for the most part, or they'll get a call back within several hours. 
Um, if the employee is at the work site, they're given a, uh, a priority, obviously out of concern of a potential uh, contact risk to coworkers or others. So if somebody calls says, hey, well, I'm at work and I have this and that, and obviously that becomes a, a more important issue than if they're waiting at home. So the interviews, there is an interview that's conducted with a physician, and I would say it's individualized. It's, it's targeted to the person's symptoms, and it includes a symptom review, what kind of symptoms they're having, some medical history sometimes, medication history, maybe they've started a new medication and that could account for certain things. And also what we'd call their COVID-19 contact risk. I mean, is it a low risk, medium, high, and possibly they're having uh, contact or been in situations or in areas where there is a greater COVID risk. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the data is confidential, so personal health information is not shared with any other person. That's really not the intent. And at the end of the day, uh, the end of the call, really, the key question is, is there a more, more plausible medical explanation for these particular symptoms and it's person-specific? And that there isn't a, a, a numerical formula or something specific, it's really tailored to that, that particular person and that individual. So for example, certain symptoms of uh, uh, COVID can include things like fatigue, headaches, uh, gastrointestinal things that are reported in studies. Uh, so are these new for that person? Maybe that person has experienced those in other situations or other circumstances. So at the end of the day, in terms of if a person has symptoms, we follow the general CDC guidelines and they would be out for a period if, if it turns out to be COVID related for a minimum of, uh, of 10 days. Um, if the person's symptoms are severe, then we would ask them to contact their personal physician, but uh, the primary care physician or prov healthcare provider does not need to be contacted in all instances and so forth. So that's a clinical judgment situation. We also will all order COVID testing sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, we use general CDC guidance in terms of testing priorities uh, and um, as to who would be tested. And that includes a consideration of the relative benefits. Oftentimes it doesn't make a difference in how you would manage a person. Uh, uh, but again, that's a, a consideration. And if there's a non-COVID-19 uh, related medical explanation, or there's a most more reliable other explanation for those symptoms, we would not restrict or make any recommendation that the person couldn't be out on campus. And in terms of the person's workability, it would be dependent upon the particular symptoms because they, for example, they might have a severe migraine that was part of a problem uh, very infrequent, but that was a cause. That can also be headaches, uh, one of the things that are considered to be COVID related. If there's a uh, more legitimate uh, explanation for that, they could have no restriction from being on campus per se, but in terms of the workability, it would really be based upon the person's uh, symptoms and how severe they were uh, and other things. If, if a person is out on an isolation, uh, um, they could also, depending on symptoms and so forth, could work remotely. So it's not a determination of, of workability per se, but whether or not you can or cannot be at campus. So there are certain people that we would also place into quarantine. So if you had a, uh, a close contact, which is defined with as being within six feet of an infected person, that's somebody who we know has COVID for at least 15 minutes, so six feet, 15 minutes, from a period starting about two days before that person became ill, because we know that the sort of the maximum period of transmissibility or, uh, occurs early on and uh, up to periods of two days before. Um, so if, if you have that particular kind of situation, you would go into quarantine. And the quarantine situation lasts for 14 days. So it's a longer period of time than if you have symptoms. And that's because the, very, the, the onset of when the illness can go is variable. And in some people, they don't become uh, ill until a, a longer period of time. So that's a, there's a longer period of being away under a quarantine basis than there is on an isolation basis. And that's a, 
a, a, a question we get frequently, well, how come somebody's out for a longer period of time than if they were ill? It, intuitively, I think if you're ill, you would be out for a shorter period than if you're under quarantine. That's, that's actually not the case. Next slide. Okay, so again, isolation, minimum 10 days. Uh, we use a symptom-based process for returning somebody back to work, which is the CDC guidelines, again, which is uh, 10 days at least after symptom onset, a resolution of fever for at least 24 hours, feeling better without any use of fever medication. So there's no need to test or have a negative COVID test, which is really not recommended anymore, but we use these symptom-based criteria. There are people that have a positive test. For example, some family member may be tested because their other family member was positive. They turn out to have a pop, they have a positive test, have very few symptoms throughout the uh, period or actually no symptoms. Uh, and that isolation period lasts for a period of 10 days from the onset of the positive test if they have no symptoms. So positive test or symptoms, a 10 day period. There are some exceptions if you're severely immunocompromised or had a very severe illness or the hospitalization, you can excrete virus for a longer period of time that's viable. And so the, that period of being away uh, could be longer. Quarantine again, 14 days. And if you actually do develop symptoms, you could result in an earlier return to work. So if you're placed out on quarantine because of a close exposure and then you became symptomatic, say on the second day, then the 10 day period could start after that and you could be back uh, before that whole 14 day period. In terms of quarantine, a negative test, so if we test you, does not result in an end of quarantine per se, because you can have a false negative test, especially early in the illness, you can be symptomatic even and you know, have, or, uh, have a negative test, but also in the quarantine process, uh, because you can develop your symptoms later on and have infection later on. A negative test, especially early on in the process, really doesn't help that much in that, in that situation. So this is a busy slide and I, uh, uh, I put this up just to give you an idea that there are categories of uh, priority categories for getting a, a COVID related test. So one of the questions is if you call COEH and you're either placed in if you're placed in isolation because you have symptoms, are you going to get a COVID test? Is that part of the process? And, and it's made on a case by case uh, basis. In most cases, the test doesn't change what you would do, but there are certain priorities for get, getting tests. These are the CDC guidelines. So hospitalized patients, healthcare providers, first responders, individuals living, working, or visiting acute care, skilled nursing, mental health facilities. So again, situations where we have lots of potential contact actually includes individuals living, working, or visiting community congregate settings such as correctional facilities, homeless shelters, but it does include edu educational institutions when you do have potential contact, uh, mass gatherings, crowded workplaces, large house households, close quarters. So you can sort of get a sense of the, the kind of prioritization that's done. Uh, people who have uh, uh, household members at high risk of disease. So like if you're living with a person who has uh, marked immune suppression or, or cancer or transplant recently and so forth. So critical infrastructure workers who work very closely with others who may not be able to socially distance in some situations. So like if you're an air control tower or in a other situation where you're looking at or operating equipment that uh, with other coworkers that just can't be dispersed. And then sort of other priority is uh, you know, critical infrastructural people who uh, are not necessarily in close contact, persons over 65, and individuals at any age with uh, sort of a significant uh, medical condition. So we use those considerations on a case-specific basis to make recommendations for testing of persons who have symptoms and we have recommended tests for a number of people who have called. Um, 
lastly, it's, it is relatively new. Uh, we're doing an ongoing assessment of responses, looking at maybe aggregate information. I can tell you right now that possibly, well, possibly that's a bad word, around 10% or so of the calls that we have received uh, have, uh, eight to 10% have been sort of cleared to go to return to work because of some other more um, legitimate uh, medical explanation for those particular problems. We plan to use that information to help support the overall COVID response of, of the university. And um, in also as a center, I think we can assist uh, the campus in looking at occurrences of, you know, person comes to work, they've had an issue, how to sort of handle, follow up on that, give information and help protect campus employees and the broader community. And I think I'll end it at that and open it to questions if there are any. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing all that information with us, uh, Dr. Fedorik. I, we have a question here in the, the Q&A um, asking if the calls to the physicians will be via Zoom or Facebook so the physicians can see the person. And it looks like the answer is probably yes. Is that right? uh, we have not been doing it per se. We've been doing it on, on, on the telephone, but that's certainly an option that we can look at to, uh, to expand. Great. Well, and I wanted to, uh, you know, ask a question here. So it, when someone calls the physicians, um, do they need to worry about the cost at all? You know, do they need to get their health insurance provider involved or anything like that? There's no cost to calling here at all. So the, the initial cost is, uh, is, is borne by the university. So there's, there's no payment or anything that is expected for that. In terms of the, the related follow-up uh, test, it, there could be a, if, if a person elects to have a test, it's my understanding that potentially uh, health insurance may be involved in certain circumstances. If there's a work-related exposure or something occurred, then there are other issues in terms of workers' comp that might cover those particular tests. But at the end of the day, I think uh, as best that I understand is that no, employees would not be responsible for payment of the, uh, of the testing that's done, as, but certainly not for the calls. I think Great. efforts would be made to, to look at to see if the initial test, if there is health insurance, to have that covered under certain circumstances. Great, thank you. Well, if anyone else has uh, additional questions, please drop those in the Q&A. Um, I'll ask one really quickly, and then uh, if, if we don't have any others, we'll probably call it a day. Um, but so how does the, the response that you've been talking about uh, work in conjunction with contact tracing? Is that a, a component or a future component that you'll be looking at? So, um, you know, the contact tracing that's occurring on the campus is, is, un, is undergoing an evolutionary, evolutionary process in that uh, the School of Public Health is going to have a large dedicated number of contact tracers that are dep deputized under the County Health Department who will follow up contact tracing within campus. At this point, um, if, if during the interview or during the process, somebody is identified or through that interview that, you know, I worked with so-and-so or I had this and that person that had potential contact, we would notify uh, because we would have a, a duty to let people know that if they were near somebody, especially that person turned out to be positive, that there was potential contact. So we would notify human resources of that. And we have been following up and calling a number of those people uh, to try to uh, assess their circumstances, get more information about the exposure, how it occurred, or their contact, and make make decisions that flow from that. Great, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like uh, contact tracing may be a rich topic for a future episode of Anteater Insider Live. Um, so we will uh, look at that and, and hopefully get more information to the campus community on that uh, soon. Well, thank you both, uh, Stephen and Dr. Fedoric. We really appreciated you taking the time to, to speak with us today. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in for this. Um, we're really grateful. And uh, until next time, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.